Um, yeah, so um, I wonder what the first topic here that we should discuss should be. Uh, there's the 0 0.12 release is, is what's uh, being worked on right now. Uh, there's a release candidate out for testing. Um, I know there's at least one bug <laughs> uh, because I made a, uh, a patch to, yeah, and it looks like that patch caused a bug. I might, I, and so the, the bundler, purse bundle doesn't work anymore, so I have to look into that. <laughs> I feel bad about that. Um, otherwise, let's see what else there's been. Um, John has made a... John Fu, he usually he's not able to make it today, but he he does the uh, chain log, change log usually for these, for this event. Um, so yeah, so he so he was able to make one and share it with me. So I, I'll just go over <laughs> the change log that he's he's collected. Um, yeah, so like I mentioned, there's a zero twelve release, um, and there's a bunch of new things in there. Uh, the release notes have a pretty good uh, overview of everything in it, but uh, we can look at some highlights here. Uh, there's been some work around the error messages so that where exactly an error occurs is better for tooling and editors and such. Uh, yeah, that's been a pretty big project in a long time coming. I think there's still some further improvements that can be done, um, but uh, yeah. Um, Uh, yeah, um, there's been some changes. Uh, the where clause is uh, represented a little bit differently in the along the along the compilation process. That helps for uh, tooling. Uh, there's been some changes around the prim modules. I'm not sure what's happened there. Uh, uh, basically, just a lot of classes got renamed and moved around. So there used to be like say rogue cons in the prim namespace. So you would have that uh, available everywhere, but now it's been moved into prim.row, so if you want to use it, then you have to bring in prim.row and, and use it. And if you just use it as a ball of an import, then, then you can do like import prim row as row and then do row.cons. It's, like it's, it's a little more clear, and because it's in the prim row module, it doesn't need to redundantly say row.cons anymore. Yeah, that's kind of mentioned down here. The, the lax type class is now baked in. It might have been part of some uh, library yeah. beforehand. What library was that? Was it like the PureScript type level library that these are in? Yeah, the type level prelude. So okay. it used to be more in a user land, but it's nicer to have the compiler just solve it quickly, and also like then it doesn't generate like as big of a dictionary in the like generate code. Mm -hmm. Because before it used to do like a whole bunch of union and con solving. Yeah, it's a little bit silly. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's that's one advantage to having these things baked in is the error messages and reasoning inside the compiler can be quite a bit better. Um, yeah, and then I mentioned that the thing that I added, which was uh, in the generated JavaScript, it doesn't use the node idiomatic uh, module imports. Uh, instead, I expanded out so it's very explicit about the exact file included. And this is necessary for um, uh, gain, getting closer compatibility with the ES6 module system, which uh, if you want to import a module from the browser, you need to know the exact path to that module file on, this, on the server side. So, that's, so yeah, this enables uh, 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 using the system, so system JS development mode to uh, there's lazy load modules compiled by PeerScript uh, without needing to go through a bundler, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, I can maybe talk about that later if we're interested. Um, looks like there have been some um, improvements for uh, the object update syntax whenever that's used. Uh, yeah, so basically the only difference is that whenever you need to update like 100 record fields, which is pretty terrifying, uh, there's a threshold in which uh, this optimizer can com 
optimization comes through. And it just calls the uh, the original record once and then uh, just mutates like one object over and over and then gives you this new one. And the idea is the same thing as Builder where you don't have access to this intermediate elements. So it's like completely opaque to you. And it's like something you might as well do. But yeah, this is like something that only affects if you are using like records with 100 fields. <laughs> yeah. It's a little scary. Do you remember the, the person who added this? Was he actually trying to, to do this? Uh, like, have did he, did he have a framework or library that was trying to update 100 fields on a single record? Yeah, I think he said that his work project was doing this for... Really? Um, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> just, like, as a result of some code gen stuff, I think. <laughs> I'd like to hear more about that project. Um, is that all that there is? There's more than that in the in that uh, RC release. Yeah, but like mostly a bunch of uh, bug fixes and those mm -hmm. are like the main. Because it's a pretty long change log. I wonder if the change log is only that long because uh, uh, it's been a while since the last patch release, even. Yeah, at least for the bug fixes. Oh, there's the overlap. The, the instance change. Yeah, instance change. That's important stuff. Yeah, so that's like really fun and also the symbol cons is also really fun <coughs> so now you can like treat uh, symbols as you would strings but in the tech level so uh, i'll talk about some stuff later it's, uh, yeah i'm curious tech. about which of these you are uh, you can talk to more about so like yeah for here this is the uh, uh type classes that are moving into prim i think uh, maybe not i'm not sure um, but yeah, the instance change. I think there is a note about what that looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Because in, in instance awesome. chains, uh, it's kind of a, a big project, instance chains. Because uh, I, I think part of the instance chain idea is uh, type guards or instance, like type class instance guards, something like this. Um, but that's not included in this initial support. But. Uh, the, the the thing that's added with instance chains right now is the else keyword in front of the instance. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean it goes down the chain goes down the chain of the most specific into the least specific instances. And uh, what it what it basically allows right now is the same thing as before when you were using overlapping instances. If you define overlapping instances before, there was kind of this hack where. Uh, any instance that matched, uh, it would try to use. And whichever one would match was determined, uh, this, this ordering of the matching order or, or matching attempts was uh, determined by the lexicographic ordering of the instance name. So it was like really happy before. But now it's like, because it actually figures out the, it's, it's the, how specific uh, instances it's, it's like, the same thing, but better. But yeah, uh, this, this doesn't do like some of the more advanced things. So it's it's kind of like you have to have your fun depths set up correctly so that you actually resolve the instance that you want with the head themselves. And then there's overlapping instances has been disabled in 0 0.12 too, isn't that right? Yeah, but then everything you could do before, you can now do more principled with instance chains. Right, so like this is a case of overlapping instances, I believe, because uh, yeah, the constraint is different, but the uh, the head is identical between these two. So if you want to forcefully choose one of the over the other, you have to like specify the name in a higher priority or something. Uh, no, well, I don't think this was before. This because this is a case where like you would need like the some kind of specific handling of cases. Um, what instance chains really allow you to do is something like if you had instance A of string and an instance A of A, right? In oh. that, string is more specific than any A. Right. Basically like that, right? Yeah. So I guess if you wanted to write this, which it would be so quite valid, then you could handle string specifically because it's, it's more specific. And then all the fall through cases, you could just apply that constraint. But that right. the constraint is only applied 
after the instance head has been matched by the fundups. Mm -hmm. So can't use constraints to match the instances. You said that what happens after fund depths? No, you can only match the instance head with the fund depths, right? With whatever fund depths you declare or whatever is implicitly the dependencies. Mm -hmm. So you can't use constraints to uh, match instances. That's some other thing. But yeah, in that case, it's like, if your L and R are determined or concrete or whatever, then they will just match, if that will be used to match an instance. You can't have multiple instances with different, um, you can't have multiple instances of the same specificity. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah. anyways, instance chains, um, is, uh, this is you know, pretty interesting, interesting stuff. Um, yeah, and then orphan instances are now explicit. Like, I think they were worn before, but now they're just re removed orphan, um, because now you can do the orphan instance, like now you can do the instance chain, so you don't need orphan instances anymore to hack around it. Yeah. Yeah, so there's like a lot of stuff here. Um, let's go back to John's notes. Um, uh, the documentation. Um, uh, type class instance resolution, more explanations around the no instance found errors. Um, so I'm guessing this is what's generated by some documentation tool, right? Using special symbols as record field identifiers. Um, yeah. Uh, PSC package. Uh, there's been a new release of that. Um, uh, no, uh, zero to, uh, so the, the, the second bullet point, it's something that someone else contributed that uh, got merged today. So we'll make a re release that sometime sooner or later. But the, uh, let's, did we talk about a, diff, a version of PSC package before? Like, did we talk about already when, when we did add this add from Valor thing? Um, it might have, it might have, I think we might have mentioned it last time. Um, okay. um, zero three to the, the thing really only different is that, um, uh, the verified package. So before when you verified a single package, it would actually install all the packages first in your package set and then do the verification of the individual thing. And that was like really like, well, just takes forever to wait for that. And it, it was only like that because originally you could only verify entire sets at a time. So I changed it over so that it would only install the specific uh, packages that it needed to verify a given package. So if you do like verify F, now it only only installs the dependencies of F and then verifies it. So that was the main change for 032. But yeah, we probably we should, Release a zero thirty three or something that does add the uh, the thing that's in the second bullet point. So someone contributed this thing where you can choose what branch you want to add instead of having it lose off to the latest version. That verify command is that uh, used in CI for verifying the uh, package set, right? Making sure everything compiles together. Is it yeah. also in is it CI, also used outside of CI? Well, well, in CI, you run verify, right? So you run verify without arguments and it checks your entire package set. But when you're adding something locally, you really only care about what you've added right here or what you've modified right here and what, what is uh, reverse dependencies are, right? So whatever you've modified, what, what depends on that? Mm -hmm. So that is done by doing like verify with the package name. So if mm -hmm. I change the version of app and I do mm -hmm. Verify F, and it verifies F, and it verifies the dependencies, I mean, uh, reverse, reverse dependencies of F. So that's what you use, like when you're just developing this locally, and then you send mm -hmm. the CS to verify the entire set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and then uh, package sets uh, for the PSC package. Uh, uh, there's been some new packages added for that, but a, a note is that the package set for uh, 012, there is a 
package set that works with the 0.12 release candidate of the compiler. Um, but that, all, that includes a, a very small subset of all the package sets in the previous, in the 0.11, 0.12 package sets. Uh, yeah, the, like I think this one only includes the core packages, like those in the PureScript uh, org on GitHub. Um, I think there's some efforts for adding the PureScript contrib orgs packages also. Um, but yeah, this is really whittled down. Um, yeah. yeah, and I mean, it'll just get built back up over time. Um, at, mm -hmm. at least I, I've been updating a bunch of repos and adding stuff to my own package set. So I have a PR open that shows just like my work in progress of whatever stuff I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the libraries that are missing will be added back in as soon as those libraries support, you know, 0 0.12 of PureScript compiler. Mm -hmm. So there's a reason for that. Oh, pr 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 the prelude. <laughs> it's very happy to see that Monoid and Semigroup Group has been added to the prelude. I remember looking at the prelude way, way back when and thinking, huh, I wonder why Mon Mon Monoid's not in here. That's like every library uses Monoid. Huh. But uh, yeah, so that, that, that'll be moving into uh, prelude. And semi-group too, of course. Um, looks like the ID function, uh, which is the... As a category ID. It's just been renamed identity, I think. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, a few other functions that's been added to Prelude. Apply n. Uh, oh yeah, there's the Euclidean division. There's that mod function. I remember there's been I know, there's some discussion around this that's been going on for a while. Uh, the the mod for negative numbers. Uh, I think it used to do this, but it should. Be six. Um, so that, like, I, I wonder. I wish somebody was here who could comment about this. Who follow, was following that thread closer than I was. Um, but I think this must be a breaking change then, so that it's more, you know, correct. <laughs> um, and then there's other functions that can help you if you're looking into doing mod-related things. Um. Implementation of standard type classes applicable to rec records. Oh, so now there's a show instance and eek instance for records? Well, that's very cool. Oh, I wasn't following this change. So we don't need new types over records to get record equality now? Well, we didn't need that, like, I think like 0 0.11 added support for type classes, which can, you know, make an eek instance for records. Oh, okay. Um, but now it must, is it, is it really in Prelude? Where, where is that? Uh, yes. It might not be in that branch specifically, but it might, or it might not be in that commit, but it, it might be somewhere else also. Oh, wait, I just saw eek record, so it's like in there. Yeah, I mean, 11.6 with roll list, you could um, implement a lot of these, but yeah, you need mm -hmm. so or concretely type functions. So like, this is uh, pretty nice for just like being able to easily derive things. Oh, is it master or is it uh, zero twelve? Yeah, it's zero twelve. Oh yeah, this one. This file hasn't been updated. Well, I gotta see this myself. This is pretty huge because everyone who comes to PureScript is like, uh, "How do I do record equality?" And it's like, well, I understand. <laughs> uh, but it's oh, you not can't. Good. You can't actually sanely do uh, object equality in JavaScript, though. Right, because object like that. That object equality refers to like exact instances of objects, right? Yeah. And that's something we don't really, like, pure script, yeah, that's not, that, that's difficult. But yeah, yeah, it looks like there's an eek instance for a record, um, as long as um, each key and value, like, in that record is equivalent. So this is structural equality. 
Yeah. Oh, makes sense. Mm-hmm. Man, that is kind of hard to believe. Because <laughs> Prelude has always been uh, is, is always so conservative in my eyes. But wow, that's pretty big news. Um, yeah, let's go back to the notes. Mm. Um, prelude or the maybe's got optional function. Hmm. So if if you have an alternative functor. Yeah, you see, does it actually just smash them all together, basically, and give you uh, the result? Oh, uh, oh, wait. So, like, this functor would have multiple A's? No, and I mean, just like it. It is just uh, applying the alternate of all all the things in your like F, right? So yeah. Hmm. But if there's multiple things in the F, so yeah. It's like, it's like an array of maybe A should then like come back with that. Well, if the F is the alternative, I guess. Yeah, I'd have to like see some examples to make more sense of this. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. Um, and then one, uh, the first has a monad zero instance. Um, note. Oh yeah, this is always a fun one. Uh, some level of conversion between maybe and either. Uh, similar to note, but for use in cases where the default value may be expensive to compute. Yeah, just whenever you want to differ mm -hmm. the calculation. Yeah. Oh, tap level prelude. Oh, there's an if fun depth. There's a few fixes in there. Nothing new. Um, all right, and then 0.12 release is uh, it drop. Well, I, I think it keeps support for optimizing the F, like the EFF. Well, yeah, uh, uh, we we did definitely need that, and then that was added a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, so now yeah, yeah, the effect has a semi group in monad, just like uh, F. Yeah, and the effect is pretty much the same as like the IO type in Haskell. Well, and but it's synchronous only. Synchronous only. Yeah. Uh, well, just in JavaScript, so synchronous. Mm hmm Bracket and field new types, generics rep. Yeah, this is actually going to be really nice for anyone who deals with generics rep because uh. Yeah, with 11.6, it was pretty much not necessary ever to deal with the rec uh, and types, like the data types for the representation. So now that uh, you just get like the actual concrete type of the record, you don't have to do any like hacky conversions, and you can just work with uh, stuff as is. Wait, so if I'm trying to remember how this works, so back in just generics, not generics yet, but generics. If you want to reflect a like a record type, was that just uh, equivalent to a product type? Like it just equated it to a product type, or did the record have its own like type in generics? Like, like what is it? What is it? What do you say that this uh, this rec means? I mean, that's like uh, just the actual record in the normal sense of generics rep. So it's like. In, in Haskell, there is no difference between a product type and a record, right? But yeah. in PureScript, since we do have like an actual record, uh, that that's what the record was turned into, a rec that's a product of its fields. Yeah. So then like whenever you wanted to do generic things with records, you have to handle these rec and field new types as a, kind of like a constructor of a product type. Like if you like take the generic rep of a product type, it's like you know product and then or a constructor name and then the argument is uh, product 
of whatever uh, argument on the left and then whatever stuff remaining on the right. So it was kind of like the before. And that's just like a very normal way to deal with that generic rep of a record. But yeah, now that we have a rotor list, it's like we can do the same thing without the penalty of converting to and from representations. And we can just use the normal uh, instance for whatever stuff, whatever records as if they were normal concrete type. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for explaining that. Uh, let's go on. Uh, exceptions. Yeah, just bump to work with effect. Because um, pure script exceptions, does this reflect the JavaScript exception, exceptions? I think that's what that was for. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it does anything more uh, generic. It's not like transforms or anything. Right. Um, but the reason that that matters is because if it's like before, and let me just verify this before I speak. Um, yeah, I had this. Throw exception, yeah. So it puts an exception into the F row. And then when you catch it, it just takes that exception out of the row. Um, but that's changing in 0, 12 because the rows are disappearing. Well, to be entirely truthful though, it's like the throw exception thing, it, it's, it's basically only going to work in like the synchronous context. Right, only, yeah, so yeah, this wouldn't work in like an AF situation. Yeah, so this is about no, 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 as dealing with I.O. It's, it's kind of expected. Mm -hmm. So, it, so it, it, it doesn't track the exception in the type. Oh, and you could always need type it if you want to. Right. But I think like with like run with uh, just normal free approaches and whatever, there's like better ways to put evidence in the type level. So you probably, right. you probably never wanted to used the F row type before. So now like, well, if you really want it, then you have to opt in yourself. Right, so this is the same way that Haskell's IO type does it. I mean, it, you can throw an error in the IO type and then it's there. And then like, it doesn't change the type at all. Like you don't, if you, if you see a type that says IO of something, uh, you'll, you don't know if there's an exception in there or not. You just, if you care, you gotta catch it. Um, right, but yeah, so if you want to know at the type level, if you're doing exceptions, you got to make a new type around it and just do it yourself. I think, I think there's some libraries, like some people are talking about making like a bifunctor IO where there's, it tells you what exception is in there as well as what it, is the resulting value. Um, yeah, and Nate has a library called like JavaScript exception or mm -hmm. JavaScript type exceptions. I forget what it's but yeah, it's like a similar idea where you can have the normal F, but then you can parameterize it with the, with the variance for what errors will happen. So you can like easily compose together multiple different things, multiple different uh, variants of the exceptions because you just mash them together. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. Yeah, and it's this one. Um. So you just store the actual type and then type level and then you can get it out as you need to. Yeah, but the, yeah, this library is a great, great readme. So if you're just interested in uh, a little bit better, uh, more safe way of handling an exception, that's a great library to look at. But like one problem I've had with the uh, tracking that at, at like in like in the effect row is if I'm um, interfacing with a, a, a normal JavaScript library and like you, you can't like if, if you don't do the interface quite right, you're you're not sure if they're like, yeah. If if you're using somebody else's library that has an interface over a, of a JavaScript thing, um, then it could be lying about if it if it, if there's an exception in there or not. So yeah. Anyways, that's excuse me. That's that. Exceptions. Um. Yeah. And then other 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 things that have changed is that we have this discourse instance now. Uh, PureScript users. 
dot ml. Uh, it, it'd be nice. We should do that like in this next month. I mean, it seems like people in the community here kind of like this discourse instance. So maybe we'll change it to like discuss.peerscript.org. Um, right. But yeah, the reason it has this uh, weird domain name right now is because it was free. <laughs> it was free for me to set up. It's, uh, it's like free nom, I think. And then you get to choose like whatever free domain name you want. So yeah. So yeah, please come and use the discourse instance if uh, you like that kind of uh, channel. Um, yeah, I haven't used Zephyr at all, but uh, it's a way of doing optimization of a PureScript program. So maybe dead tree shaking, and I don't know if it does much more than that. Um, I know that there is a Webpack plugin called Persloader, and as part of that plugin, um, it does, it, it, it takes the JavaScript AST and it will do operations on it, like dropping, um, yeah, like knowing that it's pure code, then it can do better optimizations. So it, it's probably worth looking at that to take some of, some of those, um, uh, some of those passes over the JavaScript AST and maybe applying it to Zephyr. But yeah, Zephyr is a... Yeah, I mean, part of the problem... Yeah, it's a, it's a Haskell tree shaker for PureScript programs. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure the difference the between this and first bundle. Sorry, go ahead, Justin. It uses uh, PureScript, like, the core function directly, right? So there's a whole lot of information it uses, whereas uh, Pers bundle mostly looks at uh, call sites and usages. And it doesn't really strip out, like, say, instances, because it, you might be using those instances from JavaScript or something. So it looks like there's definitely a lot more potential here for optimizing. And then the problem with the JS tools is that they can do some naive uh, shaking of modules, but usually at the actual PureScript level or PureScript output at the JS, like it, they're not usually doing too much. So yeah, it's like right now, if you want the most easy way to get fairly um, optimized bundles, then it, it is kind of to do the per bundle stuff first and then run it through a JS bundler because then the JS bundlers, at least they'll be working with something that they understand a bit more or you'll have done the upper, the optimizations that they don't know how to do. So like uh, type classes might be something that they don't know how to optimize very well. Well, no, just like even actual function calls. They, they don't actually know how to like optimize those very well. Like if you compare the output of Purse bundle to like say using like Webpack or uh, Purse or something, there's just so many things that they don't know how to do or they're very conservative about whether or not something actually might be effective or not. So mm -hmm. like, yeah, there's, there, there's still like a huge difference. And then this tool, Zephyr, is like the idea is even like even more like straight to the source of information to optimize there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sorry, I mentioned earlier the Webpack purse loader. That one might also be doing it, but yeah, this roll-up uh, thing. I think this one also does some optimizations. Yeah, this this, yeah. this I think this one I was looking at that does optimizations. But yeah, yeah, I don't want to linger too long. Yeah, roll-up in general does more aggressive changes so they can be actually breaking. Yeah, because the author of this one added some features to roll up to, um, uh, if a function is known to be pure, then roll up will do some like more aggressive things. And yeah, so this this is a promising me method too. I, I, I haven't looked at, at the Zephyr though too much. Yeah, um, yeah, and then the, there's uh, uh, the, the per, per, Purdy tool. Um, for pretty printing peer script programs. Um, I haven't used this myself yet. Justin, have you? No, and well, yeah. I mean, I don't know what it looks like, so. <laughs> Hopefully uh, it, it fixes um, formatting constraints. I think that's the only thing that I really care about. Mm -hmm. 
like formatting of terms I almost don't care about at all. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm too busy to take a look at everything, I guess. <laughs> um, I think that's all we've got here. There's also, can you hear me? Hi. Say again? Can you hear me or am I too low? Yeah. Yeah, I, there's also a poll PR to make it uh, initialized with a proper, um, you know, F or effect and uh, the PSC package or Bower JSON correctly. So it's not integrated. It's probably not going to be until uh, 12 is out of RC, but yeah, we're, we're, we're actually ready with a pulp as well. I think it's in contrib, not in pure script. Yeah, I got a PR for that there. So it basically just detects the version of the compiler and if it's uh, okay. Or newer, it just does the effect. Uh, like so, if you if you want to use uh, pulp with the zero point twelve release candidate, um, you're going to have to pull your branch. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, you, you, you don't really have to, because like only for initialization, right? Because everything else was just fine. So, and like people who know how to use pure script are not going to have a hard time to change it. <laughs> like it's just a few keystrokes, but for beginners, going to be harsh if they do pulp in it and it doesn't work. <laughs> So, so, you, so you, you said you added a flag? Or no, uh, no, no, no. So it detects the compiler version, but you can also force if you really okay. override whatever we detect to the compiler's uh, version. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that, that, yeah, that, 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 that's all we have for the 0 0.12 release stuff. Um, did you want to talk about your stuff, Justin? Um, I think your stuff is 0 0.12 related. related. Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, Ryan, do you want to talk about your stuff first? Oh, well, why, why don't you go ahead? You, you've you got the, the most topical stuff and it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's more 12 related. So uh, why, don't, why don't you go first? All right, if you insist. Um, let's see. How, how should I share my screen? Okay, can you see my screen and everything? Yes. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, since uh, zero twelve came out with these instant chains and stuff, I've been like getting to work on writing some posts about them. So, like, I wrote like a simple post about like uh, just instant chains in general, like how they work, and just this post just real fast. Like, uh, one of the things it talks about is like how um, before you might have overlapping instances like this, and you use lexicographic ordering of the instance names to like determine in what order they should match, and this is like super heavy before, right? Like this is the thing that's actually specific, and this is the one that's like the actual catch-all. So now, like if you use instance instance chains, it looks like this, where you just write whatever specific thing you want first. And then you write else instance with the whatever instances are either as specific but not of the same thing or less specific. So yeah, this is like one thing I wrote. And uh, I wrote some like two other posts about this uh, library I made called Kushiaki. So Kushiaki is this thing where it's like grilled things on a stick, where like kushi are like these uh, sticks for stabbing things. Right or stuffing things through, so it's like um, this library basically it lets you do this. Right, you have a string template that you want to format, and so you must you must say like hello whatever and then uh, whatever, and you can pass in a string to it to get parsed out, and it get gets parsed out into a well typed concrete record, and so it's like. Yeah, so in this example, it's like if I have parse URL with the string proxy uh, hello uh, slash hello slash parameter name slash parameter age, then the function turns into string to either string or record of name string age string, and then you can actually use the result of that. So this is something that's enabled by both the uh, simulcon stuff where you can cons out a, a symbol and then the instant chain stuff for how to match that. 
So this is actually mostly powered by this uh, library that Chang'e made called Record Format. So it's like uh, it's actually the normally the formatting thing, right? So you write a template string for what you what you want to format. It's so like high name, your favorite number is number, and you pass in a record like name bill number sixteen, and it says high bill, your favorite number is sixteen. And if you have it wrong, then like it's concretely typed. So it, you get the this like type error message that's just a very normal uh, compile error for type mismatch. Yeah, it's really nice to have that in PureScript. I know that when people talk about uh, wanting to do this in a type safe way, uh, you have they say, oh, you have to use dependent types to be able to to, to be able to do this. Yeah, I mean, the other one, other solution is that you have to use template Haskell or some kind of metaprogramming system that lets you mm -hmm. basically do glorified code gen, which, like, personally, I, I hate code gen, so I really like first-class solutions. Yeah, so this is a really neat way to of doing this. So it'll, like, so it does type-level string parsing, right? Where it like looks at the letter H, letter I, space, and it, so it just keeps crawling through the string until it sees the yeah curly um, breaks. I I, ha I also wrote some parsing stuff, so I'll go over that in a bit. But yeah, they, if you want to look at the original article that Chungo wrote, it's called like uh, "Well Typed Printouts Kind of Go Wrong." So this is like a really cool post for just like the changes that were necessary to make this work and how like the things work in the compiler. But um, my own like two posts that I wrote recently are just about like my library. So if we dig into my library code, um, well, we can just look at it on GitHub too. So how this works is basically we have this uh, parse URL function that you saw earlier, right? So you take the S proxy with the URL template and you feed in. And once you applied this, then you can you get this concretely type function that's a string to either string of uh, the record of the row fields, right? And this works by doing a uh, uh, this like make gets a bunch of builders together for your record builder um, and then runs them if the uh, parsing has succeeded. And the way it works then inside the implementation is that you know, it takes this uh, format list that uh, that comes out of the record format library, and then goes from from and then to uh, like the from record type into a to record type. And so, uh, I should quickly show the uh, the definition of those. So f f, f list uh, from Chango's library is uh, is a kind, right? And the two data types associated with this kind are the nil, which is like the end of the list, and then the fcons, which is like the head element of what the formatting element is with the rest of the list. And so the uh, the way that work the the format kind is then either a variable, so you know like what symbol variable you want to like match to, or the string literal. So it's like whatever hasn't been matched by the variables, it's like they're just the literal segments that you could actually either like print out if you're formatting and parse out as literal so if you're parsing. And then you have this uh, head class uh, parse that takes the input symbol and gives you back out the, the F list. So in my library, I just uh, take, take advantage of that right then. And I say like, okay, like let's do this parsing. And if I have uh, nothing, then I just return like a builder for identity. And the cause instance is where I say, okay, can I um, have the cause of, in the case that I handle the, the uh, variable, then I have the symbol that's associated with the variable, and I can like do operations in that. And so the constraints go from like, uh, okay, let's parse out the type param name from this, so like my own parsing on top of this. Uh, let's get out the name and type, and then just read the parameter of whatever the type is, and um, do this row cons where we add the, the element to our record, you know, the normal record builder stuff. And then the partial 
simple is that we just continue on the on with the list. So this head is the fcons bar, right? And then this part is the fcons lit, where this segment just says, okay, we can just continue down the list because we have a literal here. So in term level, let's just match our um, literal by stripping it, stripping the prefix from our string, and let's just continue on if it's successful. So the, the way that this parse type pram works, uh, which does like a lot of the heavy lifting in here, is that um, it says, okay, if we have the parameter symbol of it, that records, uh, record formats parse type class gives us, then either it has a type annotation, and we're going to use that to actually like figure out what the type should be, or if it doesn't have the name, uh, if it doesn't have a type annotation, then let's just like implicitly turn it into a string uh, or default it to string. So that's going to be that uh, this parse type param class goes symbol to and then the split out name and the type. And then um, the, this one just starts it off. So like you can see that like we did the symbol cons here. So we split the symbol into the head and tail and we start off the implementation where we say, where we pass in the head, that's going to be matched for a bunch of stuff. The tail that also gets matched in some cases, and then the empty string that we start off for causing elements into, or appending elements into, to actually make the name that we want to work with. And then this gets us also back the type. So we look at the implementation, it's more of the same, except it has this accumulation variable and then the name and the type. And the fun tips, importantly here, are that the head, the tail, and the cumulative are all known, are all determined. And those are used to then determine name and type. So uh, the most simple case, or the base case that we really need to handle is, okay, so what happens if we've gone through the whole string and we have like the end, the end of the string and we haven't matched anything? Then, then we know that like this is something where we don't have a type annotation, and we should just uh, put it together, put it all together. So just put the cumulate back with the x, and then return the name. And then this is all. This is always going to be string because that's the default type we want to get this. Otherwise, then the the main the main case that we should handle is this case, right? Like if we match a colon literal. Then we know that that's going to be a type annotation, right? From up here, this name colon int. So if we match colon, then we know that the accumulate that we've built up so far is the name that we actually want to use. The left side of this colon, and the right side of the colon is the type name that we want to match too. And so a match type name is just a simple class that says, okay, give me a symbol, and then I'm basically a glorified dictionary for what the types that you want to use are. If it's a string, then you get string. If it's int, then you get int. And the the error case is okay. If I haven't matched anything, then like I can't match this type annotation to a type, and it prints out this custom error. So, yeah. Wait, sorry. So you can match a a, a string to a type. Like this so this string says int in it, and then you can like do some type matching to say that this like is equivalent to the int type. Is that something you can say that well, you're doing? You can't say it's equivalent, right? I'm just yeah, I'm just using this match type name dictionaries to say like is a string basically a string map of a types, right? So I give it the string key and it gives you back the value that is a type. But this is something just I had to write myself. And there's no like safe way to do this generally. So it's kind of like just just something you develop as you need. Oh, so you have a dictionary of preset types to their yeah. uh, normal type, like type names to types. Yeah, basically. Oh, there it is. Yeah, right there, 999. Match type name string to string and int yeah. to int. In here. Sorry. I, and I you, a you don't have uh, number to number? No. I mean, and like number is like the JavaScript float number. So it's like there's no real safe way to encode that in a string, anyways. Mm -hmm. But yeah, continuing on, um, I guess I should also mention that um, like you can see that these instances, I mean, I used instance chains, right? 
and it's because say they're all like overlapping on each other's parameters in some way so if you look at this case the since the tail is being matched literally and it, the head is matched for whatever type it has in the second case we match literally more specifically match the head and then the tail is more more uh, leniently matched uh, less specifically matched so these two are already overlapping on which they're more specific on and which they're less specific on and then the last case is actually both of them are um, very non-specifically matched very leniently matched so this is why in this case like we need the instance chains to make this work and it's like way more convenient to do this. And then, yeah, this is the, actually the base case that I was talking about when I was talking about the no match. Mm -hmm. So we just step through this uh, head and tail and we just split up the tail into the head, head and tail of it. And then we accumulate the name by adding the X to the end and then we just pass it down the instances. And so, Whenever it's running through this, it will eventually either run into no match type or colon split. And that's is actually like it, right? Because there is no more code. I mean, there's this reprint thing that we referred to up there that's just string to either string A. So this is just like read JSON, basically. So it's read text into J JavaScript. So, you know, like if it's a string, then yeah, just give me the string. If it's an integer, then like let's try to turn it into a number or in, an integer from a base 10, and then let's return that if it actually works. And yeah, um, that's that's it, right? So if we go back to our uh, test cases, then it's going to be that. Um, so the first case, if we do parse URL with this string. Uh, template without any parameters, any type annotations, then it's going to be concretely typed as this uh, record of strings. And then that works where we can just read out bill and 12 as a string. In the second case, if we actually do annotate this with string and int, we get this concretely typed record with string and int, and then we can actually match name, bill, and an age 12 and 12 as an actual number this time. So yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I think it's like pretty amazing. It's like uh, something I really want to do at Haskell, but I can't. But because this is pure script, I have like the power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is very, very, very cool. It yeah, would probably be interesting in doing a router for URLs as well, because uh, that's a similar kind of parsing sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I think that I would, I'd really want to like see, uh, well, I mean, this is kind of like already the basics of how you do router, right? And I think the only thing I would add on top of this then is uh, eventually do something like say, uh, if I can give like a concrete um, like match routes or something, if I can then give me a give a uh, a record of routes, then I want to go like be able to like uh, do some like take the string input for whatever the URL is and then give back out um, something or I don't even know like or routes and then matchers. And then the string thing in, and then that uh, does whatever stuff, and like this kind of routing could be done. Like, uh, um, yeah, uh, actually, it's unrelated. I, that's basically what I did with this Chocopy library. So it's like uh, you can provide uh, these sources and sources into a sync, and then each. Um, sync gets then gets uh, sent to these drivers so something like this you could do with the road list on top of that so just going from this to a routing library is like should be just a matter of work of nailing down this stuff yeah yeah it looks like it would be very interesting 
Hey, uh, Justin, I have a question about the else instance. I think that's the first time I've seen that. Is that something new to PeerScript or? Yeah, or it's the uh, instance chain thing in 0.12. Okay. Sorry, I missed the first hour. Okay. Ah. okay, that's wonderful. Wow. Yeah, it's it like even in this current form where you can only drive the instance matching by the fund ups, it seems like something that's simple, but like incredibly powerful, like lets you do like so many fun things. Yeah. Yeah, looking forward to using that. And actually, uh, I, I think if anyone like really wants to go at like solving impossible problems, you technically, I think, could make both a Vue.js template library using symbols and you could make a well-typed GraphQL library that types both the entire query for validity or parses the query for validity and types the actual parameters inside the query. So if you really want to go ham with this, then you probably could. Can you do triple quotes for tight uh, little strings? Um, I think you can only do, I, I think you only need one, right? I'm not sure. I mean, because if you're going to start to putting like lots of strings at type level, you're going to need triple quotes at type level. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've never done, I've never used this like this way, so I have no idea. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I guess it works. So you can triple quote things. <laughs> well, that, that's perfect. This this is a little silly, but yeah. <laughs> triple quote a whole whole JavaScript file. Yeah, I mean, I I think you definitely could, right? Like, I, so I'm not I'm talking about like say like you do like ASDF int or whatever, and so you could write a type of little parser that says like goes through, takes out all the tokens and tokenizes them into a list, and then works with the uh, individual tokens, just doing like string level parsing. So you can have a kind that says like um, of like foreign import kind um, GraphQL things, right? And that's going to be uh, or whatever, whatever the hell. And then you can do like foreign import data field, and it's like GraphQL things, and it takes a um, like like symbol and type. And then you'd have like some class that says like parse out type um, and symbol to, uh, yeah, like the same thing as before, I guess. A symbol into name, oops, name and then type. And the, the fun, fun this would be simple to name type. But you could do probably do something like this if you really wanted to. Oh yeah, and I think the other like crazy idea was that someone wanted to write like type level SQL using the string parsers and then just parse it for validity and the types. Yeah. Sky's the limit. It's just a matter of how much you want to do this. Uh do you have do, do you have any knowledge about the uh relative performance of doing this type level is this all just compile time? Yeah, I mean, it's all compile time, right? Um, I mean, there is like the runtime dictionary cost because mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of empty instance dictionaries that are used because it's all type level stuff. Right. So it's like, there is that, but uh, it's like, it, it costs like almost nothing to call a bunch of empty dictionaries. The biggest problem would just be... Um, those, uh, those dictionaries? Think, oh, go ahead. Well, the only thing that I know of so far is that if you have a recursive type, then those can be very expensive. So if you encoded this as like a type level tree or type level recursive uh, structure or something, then it could be like quite expensive. I think if it's just a normal list, it should be fine because it's like finite length. But like say mm -hmm. if you were dealing with like a PNL numbers and such, like those are already kind of a problem. So if you did something like that, then it will be pretty bad or not like so bad but like maybe you could add like start adding like a minute to your compilation time 
Well, so like, what would the compilation all... time uh, be proportional to how long of a string you're, par you're parsing with this? How long of a tight little string? Or would it just be proportional to the complexity of the data type that you're building from it? Um, mostly to complexity, right? But then, yeah, in the case of the this class that I have here, right, it, since it's uncoupling the individual elements, then at least in this implementation, it's going to be like a kind of difficult or kind of extensive to like go through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think uh, if you want something that's like super performant or uh, I don't know, like if you if you want to like be able to do a whole lot of things, you might have to generate some code. But at least for a lot of the general cases of dealing with symbols, then you should be able to just implement it at the tight level like this. So it's kind of like writing for all I could guess. Yeah, this is it for me. So I have like uh, three blog posts based on this. And I even have a repo of my blog post because I'm like, I'm insane. So <laughs> I have like 23 things in 2018, apparently. So yeah, at least these three things are relevant to 0 12. The rest is just like meaningless rambling. <laughs> well, they're fun to read. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. I guess uh, Ryan has some stuff for Pierce Rebellion. Yeah, should I, uh, should I get, get going or are there any more questions for Justin? Okay. Yeah, I've been, uh, so I've been working away at uh, an implementation of the Elm framework uh, in PureScript and uh, uh, making a bunch of progress uh, again recently. I, I did a whole whack of work on it about two years ago and then kind of set it aside for a while. And then a couple of weeks ago, I got motivated to uh, sort of pick it up again. And uh, I, I came across some really interesting techniques as I was working on uh, an implementation of Elm's JSON decoders. And, uh, and so I thought it might be interesting to um, talk about some of them. So here, let me try to share my screen. Okay. So was this uh, Elm JSON, JSON decoders for a specific version of Elm, did you say? Yeah, I was, uh, well, essentially, uh, it's for Elm, Elm version 18. So the latest version of Elm is, is what I'm uh, working on at the moment. Uh, so, so a JSON decoder is uh, essentially a way of taking a JavaScript value and bringing it into Elm as a, uh, as a, as a genuine Elm value. And so it's doing roughly the same job as foreign uh, is doing in PureScript or, or the Argonaut uh, packages. Um, and uh, so if we take a quick look at the Elm code, uh, you can see that we've got this decoder type here. And the, uh, now how can I get rid of, ah, good, okay. Um, We've got this decoder type here, and it's parameterized by this A, which is the type of the result that you're expecting. So if you've got a decoder string, well, like you have here, if you have a decoder string, then when you decode your JSON, you're either going to get a string at the end of the day, or you're going to get an error. Uh, so if it wasn't a string, you're going to get an error. Or if, it, if the JSON wasn't well formed, you're going to get an error. If you get something, uh, that isn't an error at the end of the day, it's going to be a string. Uh, and so you've got several primitives. You've got string and bool and int. Uh, and then you've got some, I don't know, you could maybe, maybe you could call them combinators, sort of a list, for instance. So you give it a decoder, and then you get a decoder that can decode a list of those things, um, or an array or a dictionary, which is what Elm calls uh, uh, a map. Uh, and, uh, 
And then you have some mm, fancier combinators. Well, then you have some combinators that, that sort of manipulate the JSON. So dive, so dive into a field in a JSON object and then decode what you find there with this decoder. And, and then you've got some fancier ones like one of, uh, choose, which is the first decoder that works. And then you've got your map and your uh, map to, which we would call lift to, and uh, so on and so on. And so then you hit decode value. So decode value, in a way, is, is where the rubber hits the road. So now we've got our decoder. Uh, and then we've actually got a, a JavaScript value, a JSON value. And so given those two things, decode value produces either the thing you want, either the, the A type or your error. And uh, so now you can see that most of this is done in Elm in native code. Uh, so there aren't a lot of clues here about what the implementation is. Uh, uh, but in looking at it, it occurred to me, I mean, you can re-bracket this, right? So decode value, uh, value, you could re-bracket it like this and think of it as decode value given a decoder will return you a function from a value to a result. A result is just a fancy either, uh, really. So you get either a string or an A. So from a decoder to a function. So when I was um, implementing this in uh, uh, PureScript, my first implementation, I thought, well, why don't I, why don't I make the decoder just be that function? Um, so we, 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 that's what we want in the end. We want to move from a decoder to a function. What if the decoder just was that function? So this is my first attempt. Uh, uh, decoder uh, is just a new type over a function from a value to result string A. And so you can see that my decode value is then going to be extraordinarily simple. Uh, all I have to do is unwrap the decoder and run it. Like there's, there's nothing uh, to it. And and everything else works out pretty well too. So say for something like succeed, where I'm handed a, uh, uh, I'm handed a value and then that's what I'm gonna decode. Well, okay, that's just pure, um, I'd have to show you the pure. Okay, well, let's take a look at fail. Fail's pretty easy. Uh, fail is a decoder that uh, is just gonna fail no matter what you give it. So the string is the error message. And then in order to construct the decoder, I just have to construct the, uh, uh, the, the function from a value to a uh, result. And I'm doing it in point free style here, so it's not uh, quite as obvious, uh, but it could be something like, um, uh, it could be something like val to, uh, well, in fact, we don't care about the val in the fail case, so it'd be something like, Error, and then I guess I'd have to give it a something like uh, something roughly like that. I might not have it quite right, but that should be roughly equivalent to what I had before. Is, sorry, Ryan, do you mind if I ask a question quick? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, you were showing us the Elm standard library's uh, JSON decoder, right? Yeah. Um, and then you were looking to port that? Yeah. to the peer script? That's right. Because it looks, it looks like you're changing the type a little bit, so it's not a direct port anymore. Well, where, okay, so where, uh, where I, I don't mean to be, uh, so where, where am I changing the type? Uh, the, the decoder type at the top, you, you said was a, a, a type alias for the fu function of, of uh, a uh, value alias, to result type. but a new type, type, right? So, yeah. Well, a new type, so right, it's, yeah. Uh, uh, so all you can see from the outside is, is the decoder A. You don't really see this from the outside, if you know what I mean. And but is the, the Elm one, do they also do uh, yeah, the, Elm one. the now, same? Where is that? Uh, 
So what they do is, now remember that in Elm, type actually means data. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this is not an alias on the Elm side. This is, a, uh, this is like in pure script terms, this is a data uh, decoder equal A equals decoder. Uh, and in fact, in pure script terms, this is really a foreign uh, import data uh, decoder. Uh, I forget exactly what the syntax is for it, but, but essentially what this is doing, um, like this is all implemented on the Elm side in uh, JavaScript. And so this, uh, uh, this decoder declaration here uh, doesn't really mean what it looks like. It's, uh, it's really... A, so the, the native code um, is, it corresponds to your peer script description yeah. of this? It's a function from a value uh, to no, a No, no, in fact, uh, it, it doesn't exactly. Uh, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. OK. All right. So. Oh, so the, so for, for the uh, Elm one, it's uh, each implementation, it just defers to some native JavaScript functions, right. right? So that like the implementation is not an Elm pretty much at all. They just use types to yeah, describe so the right. so native really, JavaScript functions. In the Elm implementation, almost all of these things are just uh, types over uh, uh, the native code. So, so you could think of these all as being foreign import uh, uh, declarations. Uh, what they amount. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for answering that. Um, so this is what I originally did. And then with the, uh, uh, in order to do some of the um, things like mapping and such, all you have to do is unwrap the function and then uh, map do a map, uh, kind of a composition on the function, and then rewrap it, and uh, and you can do that in each case. So to get uh, to get your alternative for your kind of one of these, then you can uh, unwrap them both. You can run the decoder on the, you can run the first decoder, you can run the second decoder, and then uh, uh, either return whichever which, whichever one worked or or keep going. Uh, for your apply instance, again, you just unwrap the function on both sides and then you rewrap it. Uh, and so essentially I'm using the, in order to do my interesting instances and combinators and things, I'm simply uh, unwrapping the functions, uh, uh, using the function instances uh, and then rewrapping it so that it's a decoder again. Uh, and so, you can implement all of this in uh, uh, really very, very little code. Uh, you can see as I sort of scroll through here that I'm, uh, I've got an implementation for the whole uh, Elm JSON decoder, and uh, it really doesn't uh, amount to very much. It's a, uh, uh, you know, quite uh, straightforward. But there is a fly in the ointment. And the fly in the ointment is uh, that Elm uses decoders in a particularly interesting way in its virtual DOM. Uh, in, it, in the virtual DOM, when you want to listen for events, you have to supply a decoder. And uh, a decoder that will turn the event into uh, an Elm message that your program knows how to process. And so the consequence of that is that when your virtual DOM is comparing the old DOM to the new DOM in order to, uh, uh, that is the old virtual DOM to the new virtual DOM to do its, its diffing, to see what patches it has to make to the real DOM, it's got to look at the decoder you supplied last time and the decoder you supplied this time, and it's got to try to figure out whether they're the same decoder or not. Are they equal? Because if they're equal, then it can just leave the listener in place. It's, uh, it's already listening, it's already doing the right thing, you don't have to touch it. Whereas if they're not equal, then it's gonna have to do something to that listener that uh, uh, you might be listening for something else uh, now or you might be doing something else with it. Your, your decoder is different and so it's gonna have to make some adjustment uh, to the listener that was previously active 
in order to uh, uh, adjust the, uh, the DOM. So if you look at uh, the ELM code, uh, here is the, the ELM code uh, on the left that it's using to test the equality of two decoders. So you've got A, which is one decoder, B, which is another decoder, and then it goes through and it's, um, uh, it's uh, 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 trying to test whether they're the same decoder or not. And just looking at how it's doing this, you can kind of see that Elm was not just wrapping a function when it created a decoder. Instead, it, was, uh, it created a, a kind of an ADT, uh, although it did it in JavaScript. So it's, it's uh, so like here's succeed, for instance. Uh, instead of returning a function, which is what my code was doing, it has a seater and a tag, and then the thing that you passed in, and for fail, a different tag and, you know, that, um, et cetera, et cetera. So like, you can see that while this is JavaScript, it's, it's kind of been programmed in a sort of slightly functional style um, where you've got constructors and then the parameters that the constructors take. Um, the, uh, and then, in a sense, it, what it does is it defers the actual evaluation of all of this. So then you have a rough function in here somewhere. Ah, um, uh, yeah, so run help. So what this does is it takes your decoder's tag and then it, it, it actually constructs the function that you need. So if, it if, if you're looking for a bool, then this is how you move from a JSON value to a bool. If you're looking for an int, then this is how you do it for an int. Uh, so it's kind of uh, deferred the, uh, uh, the process of constructing the function, which I was doing right up front. Uh, so I needed to implement something similar to this. And so let's just take a look at how I, uh, oh yeah. So, so the problem with how I was doing it of course, is that you can't test functions for equality. Um, it's, it's a well-known uh, uh, problem that you can't uh, reliably test uh, functions for equality. Now, if you're given two functions, uh, at least in, in pure script, you know, with a JavaScript backend, uh, each of those functions, you, you can test them for reference equality. Uh, so you can see, you can test, is this the very same function? that I've been given. That is something that's got a stable reference, a, a function that we've defined at the top level and we've given a name and we provide, if we provide that name once and then later on uh, we provide that name again, uh, we can test that we've been given exactly the same thing, if you know what I mean. However, um, so often what we're actually doing with functions is partially applying them or we're creating lambdas right at the call site. And when we do that, then we're not getting uh, exactly the same reference every single time. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we may be getting a function that in reality is equal, that's doing the same thing, but if it's constructed right at the call site, um, and we don't, we're not given a stable reference each time, then we don't know that. And of course, my implementation uh, was doing a whole lot of uh, constructing, uh, unwrapping and rewrapping functions. So you remember how I was, uh, how I was creating the uh, instances, for instance, you know, to create the map instance, I was taking the function, unwrapping it, and then composing it. And so even if you handed the same function to uh, my map function here uh, a couple of different times in a row, even if you handed it the same function and the same decoder, um, you would not get the very same function at the end of the day. Uh, it, you would get a, a kind of a newly produced function with a different reference that we wouldn't be able to test for equality. So I had to figure out a way around that. And so my strategy was to uh, essentially do a, a kind of a version of what the Elm code uh, did. So 
Here is uh, in the new version what uh, the, a decoder looks like. Instead of immediately constructing the function I need, I just kind of keep track of what are the inputs. Um, so it becomes a kind of a two-stage process the way that the Elm code was a two-stage process. First, you collect uh, the inputs and then later on, you can construct the function when you need it. And so some of this stuff is kind of simple. Uh, let me show you what the succeed case looks like. So in the succeed case, we get an A, so whatever A is, and we're gonna produce a, a decoder. Uh, you can ignore the just eek for a moment. I'll, I'll talk about that later. But for the most part, we're simply just capturing the A. So my succeed uh, case on this side just keeps track of the A. And I'm also, I also capture an equality, I also capture the equals instance uh, if it's got one, um, uh, because I can use that if we have it. Uh, for a variety of reasons, I didn't want to insist on having uh, an eek constraint. So this is my way of, of capturing the eek function if, if I'm given one, and, and not, but not insisting on it. Um, and some, uh, uh, then, and then some of the, some of the primitives um, are, let's see. Oh yeah, so for string, for instance, I, uh, I capture it as a from foreign. So I take the read string function and I feed it into from foreign, which will store any function from a foreign to the thing that we want. Now, this works for testing equality because read string happens to have a stable reference. So read string is a top level function. I can test it for reference equality the next time I see it. And so I store it. Uh, here, and uh, the next time I see a decoder that's been produced the same way, I will be able to detect um, that they're equal. Now, what about things that change the type of the decoder? Um, so, like, take map as an example. Um, if, if we were going to just follow this strategy of just collect the inputs, so don't do anything with them, just collect them, then what we would be looking at is collecting something like, it would look something like uh, A to B and, or wait a second, D to, D to B to A, I guess. No, A to B, decoder A. To get a decoder A, it would be like B to A. Well, actually, let's call it I for input. So we're going to have some kind of input and it's going to take us to an A and then we want a decoder for the I. Uh, so that's what it would sort of look like uh, if we were just collecting. Now the problem of course is that I don't want this I to appear up in the type. Like this is going to be a decoder A and I, uh, I need to forget uh, this I. I, uh, I. I don't want to keep track of all the kind of intermediate types uh, up here. And so what I need to do is somehow forget uh, the I, and, but still be able to match it up later when I need it. So uh, I actually had, had coded this up using existentials in the data exists uh, package until I realized that uh, it's actually a Koyaneda and there's a, a Koyaneda package that does it nicely for you. So let's, uh, here we can look at that. Oops. So Koyaneda, uh, is exactly what I just described. So you can see it, it, it bundles up a function and a source, you might say. Uh, so here's where you're coming from. Uh, and here's the function that's doing the transformation. And so you then have an FA and an I. Now we wanna forget the I. 
So the way we forget the I is with this new type that uses an existential type to, to just have the F and the A, uh, and we forget the I. So to create one, we use this Koyaneda function, which we'll get to eventually. Where are you? There you are. We use this Koyaneda function that collects the two things that we've got. And, and then, but how do you use it? You use it with this uncoyanata function. Now, this is a kind of a continuation passing style, I think, is what uh, it's called. So what it's saying is, uh, uh, given a coyanata, uh and then given a function that takes the things we've saved, the, the function and the thing we're coming from, and then turns them into something else, so the R can be anything, we, we choose the R, uh, then we can, we, can we can kind of recover the things that we had originally saved and produce some kind of R. Um, so that way we get to forget the type that we didn't want to remember. So, let's see. So just showing you how that gets used in uh, the implementation of decode value. So on the, uh, so if I'm decoding a value and I hit a map, then I've got this coyanata, and then I can call uncoyanata, and then I get back the tagger and the decoder that I stored. And then the code is really much the same as, as it would have been before. I, uh, I, I've got the, the, the function that does the mapping, I've got the decoder, and so I can use the function, compose it, I can run uh, the decoder uh, to get a function, uh, turn this decoder into a function, and then I can compose it with the, this function. So essentially, it's a way of, uh, of collecting the information that I need in order to do the map, uh, and then forgetting the type that I don't want to remember, and yet when I need to use it to be able to recover the, the tagger and the decoder. And of course, even though I've forgotten the type, uh, it, the compiler at least knows that the types match because we've got a B to an A and an FB here. And so it knows that this B type that we've forgotten uh, is uh, at least it knows that these two match and so it can run the function on the input. That much it, can, it remembers. So that's what makes it work. Ooh. And then the really nice part is that when we're doing, when we're doing the, uh, when we're testing the uh, equality with the decoders, then I can do a similar thing. Um, let's find the map case. Ah, okay. So in the map case for the decoders, I've got I've got a coyanata on the left and a coyanata on the right, and I'm trying to determine whether they're equal. And so I can run an uncoyanata on the left one to get the the tagger and the decoder on the left. And I can run uncoyanata on the right one to get the tagger and decoder on the right. And then the two taggers are both functions. And so I can just use reference equality to see whether those two functions are the same. So, I mean, I can't do any miracles here, of course. Uh, uh, it, at the end of the day, when I'm given functions, all I can do is use reference equality on them. But the nice thing about this is that I've actually saved the function. So instead of using the functions to compose a new function, which makes it impossible to test reference equality because the two separate compositions will never be reference equal to each other, I've saved my inputs. And so if my inputs are reference equal, then I can still tell that they were reference equal. And uh, uh, so that, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, ends up being a really uh, nice uh, technique. Then, Sorry, what, uh, what was the thing that you were saving? Which function exactly were you saving and pulling out 
in this then the, the, the mapping function so when i when i give when i when i call when, when when somebody calls map and gives me a function in order to transform the decoder then i just save that function and uh and then i can actually compare uh to see whether on two different occasions i was given the same function so that's really neat And then I apply the same strategy for my applicative and, and my bind uh, instances. And I, uh, I didn't know uh, whether, uh, uh, I mean, this is reminiscent a little bit of a free monad. And uh, in fact, it's quite possible that, that I could turn this into a free monad. I, I actually tried free monads and uh, I, I was having trouble it was kind of one too many steps, you know, I was, I was having trouble. I kind of needed to start with a simpler an example of a free monad to get my head around it. And so I thought, well, I'll try constructing this manually and then uh, I'll try to figure out free monads later. But one thing I did is, okay, let's see. So in my, uh, like take my, let's take the bind instance. No. Okay, here's uh, here's my here's my instances. Um, so so here, uh, in order to do a bind, so with the bind, I get a decoder and then a function to run essentially on the results of, of running that decoder. So your ordinary kind of bind. Um, so what I do here is I construct a bind. And so again, it's just remembering the inputs. And so here my bind is a, what I call a bind coinata. It's just something I invented. And it's like a coinata, and you can, if you remember what, what, what the coinata looked like when I showed it to you, it, it sort of looks the same. So you've got your, uh, you've got the thing that you're going to run it on, and then you've got this function, and then you've got this I type, which is sort of the intermediate type that you want to forget. And so then you can forget it with this uh, new type with the, uh, uh, using the data exists package. And then in order to store up the value, you store it with this bind coinata. And then to, uh, to use it, you can use unbind coinata. And so it's exactly the same pattern. And then if you look at the way decode value works, then uh, it's exactly the same as a map. I can take my value. I can unbind the coinata, and now I've got my inputs again. I've got my decoder and my function, and then it's easy. I can just do the normal thing. I can, uh, I can just implement my uh, uh, bind instance. And so in a way, what I've done is, is kind of turn this into sort of a front end uh, and a back end. Um, and, and one of the sort of slightly interesting things is that parts of the, of the bind instance, I can actually fully implement on the front end without worrying about the back end. So uh, if I'm going to decode an empty, then by the, uh, the laws for the, the plus um, uh, class, I'm going to have to give back an empty. And so I can actually do that right up front uh, without, without waiting. Uh, I, I, in a sense, it's an optimization. Uh, and if I'm given a fail, then uh, we're just going to pass that fail through. And I can actually do, again, do that up front. I don't have to actually remember anything about uh, what I was given because uh, uh, I know we're going to fail. Uh, I, can, I can already tell. So there's, I can, in a sense, uh, optimize that, uh, which I think is kind of neat. Um, so let me, ah, uh, yes. So let me then see where I am in my notes. Uh, okay, I've looked at that. And uh, okay, so let's just, I'll, I'll just give you another little look at what, um, what the function for detecting the equality of decoders looks like. Uh,
So there's a bunch of cases that are um, that are kind of trivial. Uh, so for instance, uh, uh, a fail decoder, a decoder that's always going to fail, is equal to another fail decoder if the two reasons are equal. Uh, so that's easy enough to do. And of course, in my first implementation, I wouldn't have been able to detect this at all, because on the left side, I would have constructed a function, and on the right side, I would have constructed a function, and they, would have been, they wouldn't have been referentially equal, and so I wouldn't have been able to tell that these were two equal decoders. But because I've delayed the construction of the function, I can actually tell here. And, uh, and in the field case, where I'm, I'm going to apply a decoder to uh, uh, one of the fields, then I can just check, well, is the field name the same on the left and the right? And then they're the, so that I can say they're equal decoders. Uh, so some of these are really easy. And then I've shown you the, uh, uh, the map uh, uh, implementation. And so that's... Uh, you know, less easy because we do have to check referential equality of the functions we were given. Uh, but that, you know, that's the best we can do. And at least we've preserved uh, the best we can do. Um, so, so you can see that the general strategy here is to kind of split up the logic. Uh, at the front end of the logic, we just collect the inputs. And then at the back end of the logic, uh, we can uh, uh, actually, in a sense, interpret what we've collected in one way or another. And in a way, what I've written here is two separate interpreters. Uh, one interpreter runs the decoder and produces this function from a, from a, a JSON value to the result we want. And the other interpreter takes two decoders and tries to determine whether they're equal uh, or not. Um, but there's another... There is a, a kind of a problem with splitting up the uh, logic in this way that I'll try to illustrate. Uh, and the, the problem, it, it's, it's sort of a problem with the way in which we've, uh, it's sort of a problem in the way in which we hide the intermediate types. Uh, so if you think about the, Think about the A here in a decoder A. So this is the, the, the result that we're going to come up with with this decoder. So it might be a string, it might be an int, uh, it could be a variety of things. Now, there's some cases where this matches up really well. Let's take the succeed case, for instance. Uh, when we produce one of those, so our succeed function, um, we take any kind of A and, we're, and we produce any kind of decoder A. And when we, uh, when we, when we uh, uh, store it here in our intermediate stage, it, it also can be anything. So you might say that our succeed case is fully polymorphic. Like the A truly, truly could be anything uh, in our succeed uh, uh, case. But there are cases where our A is actually fixed, where we actually know what the, uh, uh, what the A is. So take the value decoder as an example um, there. So what, what the value decoder does is it just... Uh, uh, it actually just surfaces the value, you might say. So you're given a JSON value. The value decoder just, uh, just gives you that value. Uh, instead of turning it into something, it just gives you what it actually is. And, and you'll note that instead of producing any kind of decoder, what we're promising here is that a value will produce a decoder that gives you the foreign value itself, the value. Now, there's a little bit of a problem there, though, um, because let's, let's go to where we, uh, where we are going to actually implement decode value. The, the implementation of value in one way is really quite uh, simple. Um, uh, it, uh, 
uh, we, we, what we want to do, so the, our target here, the thing that we're, we're wanting to produce here is a function from value to result string something. And in this case, the something is in fact a value. And so this will always succeed clearly because we have a value, we want to produce a value, so there's no way to fail. And all we have to do to give the value is just give ID. ID is the function from a value to a value. So you would think this is totally straightforward. So you would think that all we would have to do is, let's just take this out. Uh, all you, you, you'd think that all we would have to do is supply the ID function, and then to turn it into a result, we can just say, okay. Uh, we, we can just compose it with okay to, to get the, uh, to, to capture the fact that we're always succeeding. But let's try to compile this now that I've changed it and see what happens. Ah, okay, now we've got a problem. So what, what's, what's the problem? What's, what's going on here? Um, the problem is that the compiler knows that uh, this ID is going to produce a value uh, because uh, the, the type that we're returning up here is uh, a function. So again, you can re-bracket this. Uh, so the type we're returning here is a function from value to the result. And so, it, the compiler knows that um, we're returning a value. Um, the problem is uh, this has to work for any kind of A. You see, we're polymorphic in our A. And so uh, it knows, the compiler knows that the result uh, is a value, but uh, this function is supposed to work for any kind of A. Uh, and, and so the, uh, the problem is that the compiler doesn't remember that in this case, we've actually promised that the value itself, uh, that the A is a, is a value. That is, we, we haven't, see, the, the A is actually has to be something specific in this case. It's not really fully polymorphic. Um, so, so what this coerce sim is doing is, see, if you think about it, the, uh, uh, What's going on here is that in our various cases of a decoder, we sometimes have some information about what the A has to be, what it has to unify with. And so in this case, we know that the A is a foreign. And then this little squiggly line is, is, what, uh, is actually just a type uh, operator for the Leibniz constructor. So it, it's equivalent to this. Uh, it's saying, essentially, this is saying, we've got some evidence that the A is actually a foreign. Uh, in this case, as not, not in this case, you see, in this case, we don't have any evidence. In this case, we've got some evidence about uh, uh, what the A actually is. And so, oh. And so in order to create this, uh, in order to use this constructor, constructor, we've got to provide the evidence that we're uh, really expect, that, that the A really is gonna be a foreign. And then we can hang on to that evidence. And then we can use that evidence to make uh, the, uh, the A a foreign, to coerce it uh, when we're giving the answer here. So, it's, it's, so it's a kind of a, it's a way of remembering uh, uh, that this case 
In this case, we've, we've actually got a more specific type than you might otherwise think. So if you look at where we create the value, we've said here, we've promised in a sense that when you call value, you're gonna get a decoder value. And this ID function is our, uh, uh, provides the Leibniz module with some evidence that, we're, that we really are uh, uh, going to give uh, uh, a, a value. Oh, and, and value, sorry, is just, uh, it's, they're just type synonyms. So you can say that, uh, should have said that. Then, so let's say, let's say that we were to say here that we, uh, that we were gonna give a decoder int instead. What would, what would happen? What, what, what would the compiler's complaint be? Ah, okay, it can't unify foreign with int. So here it knows that, uh, it looks at the constructor here and it's supposed to show that A is a value, but instead it's showing that A is an int. And so we've, uh, there's a mismatch between uh, what we promise here and what we're actually recording here. So let's say we fix that. Let's say that we, uh, we said, okay, uh, we're gonna promise an int, and so we're gonna record the promise here. So we record that we've promised an int. So let's try to rebuild that. Ah, so now we've still got a problem, but it's not here anymore. This is fine, see, because uh, we've promised an int, we're recording that we've promised an int, that's fine. But now, what? Uh, oh, okay, that's okay, hang on. I can just delete that for a moment. Ah. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. But now when we use it, so now we're in our uh, uh, decode value uh, function where we're using the decoder A. Uh, now, when we try to coerce, uh, when we try to coerce our ID function here, which is producing a value, and we try to coerce it to the A, uh, it says, well, wait a second, you promised that A would be an int. Uh, actually, it's a, uh, it's a value, and so we don't type check. Uh, uh, and again, remember, foreign is just a synonym for value here. So, uh, uh, so now, I haven't really said very much about how Leibniz equality works. It's very clever, and, and you can look up the, uh, uh, the thing, and I'm probably not even the best person to kind of talk about the, the, the sort of interesting way uh, in which it works. What, what I found really fascinating about this is the way it allows you to enforce this, uh, this, this kind of uh, promise, recording the promise, and then uh, uh, executing on the promise and the, the, the kind of sort of triangle uh, that this forms. So if I change this back to being a value, so I'm promising a value and then I try to rebuild, then this is fine because I've recorded a promise that I'll give it a value. And in fact, I am coercing a value here and but, but now the problem is over here, that here I say that I'm going to provide uh, an int, but I'm recording a promise to provide a value. So if I change this back so that I'm, I'm promising what I'm actually gonna record, and then I do what I record, uh, then everything compiles again. Uh, so it's just a, it's a, it's a technique that, um, that really uh, fascinates me. Uh, Sorry, Ryan, can I ask uh, how you're making an instance of the Leibniz value there? Is it the, yeah. ID, the ID function will actually create an instance of Leibniz? Yeah, so Leibniz has a category uh, instance. And so what ID is uh, doing here is it's, okay, so the evidence that Leibniz requires uh, is evidence, uh, so we've got two types here, this A and this value, and 
the, the evidence that Leibniz requires is evidence that for any uh, type constructor, you could turn uh, uh, an A into a value or a value into an A. Uh, and so there is only one function that you could use to do that, uh, which is ID. And so by providing an ID, you've kind of proved that the two um, uh, types unify, and then you can construct a Leibniz that way. Uh, <laughs> that's probably not the very best explanation in the world, but, but the, the ID here, well, here, we can do a P go to, and it should take us, oh, it's taking us to the category instance, of course. Uh, so we'd have to, uh, Yeah, I'm not sure if I can give a better explanation of it than that. It's yeah, uh, that's fine. I can take a look at it later too. Yeah, um, but it, it it looks like uh, the it, like the equality part of it, uh, like you can go from A to B and you go from B to A equivalently. Yeah, it, there's, there's a function called S Y M M. Yeah, the metric. All right, did you say that you're using that in the decoder function? Yeah. So. So I use it a couple, like in a couple of places. There's a coerce function that if you've got a Leibniz AB, so showing that, that type A is equivalent to type B, then you can coerce from A to B using a coerce function. If you want to coerce from B to A to go in the other direction, then there's a coerce sim function uh, that, that just turns the arrow around essentially. And then there's a sim function. Mm -hmm. If you want to go from a Leibniz AB to a Leibniz BA, you can you can sort of manipulate uh, the Leibniz because obviously if A is the same type as B, then B is also the same type as A. Mm -hmm. What is that transitivity? Uh, yeah. Commutivity, maybe, or maybe commutivity. So, uh, <laughs> so there's one more uh, example I want to show you. Just uh, that that's kind of. Uh, interesting. It's an even more advanced uh, version of using uh, Leibniz equality. There's this run array uh, 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 function and, or, or constructor. And uh, so the cases I've talked about uh, uh, so far are uh, cases where you either are fully polymorphic and the A can be anything, or your, uh, or you're very specific and you know exactly uh, what the type is going to be. Uh, in the run array case, uh, I don't know exactly what the type is going to be. The type is, is what you might call partially polymorphic. The, the way you can see this is in my unfoldable function. So given a decoder that decodes something, so say uh, uh, an int, so it might decode an int, I want to produce a decoder that, uh, that can decode anything that has an unfoldable instance, uh, and it'll be an unfoldable instance of, of, of whatever that was. So, I mean, you can sort of see it in the example. So if you're given a JSON array of one, two, three, four, and then you, uh, uh, you, you, uh, um, you give it, uh, uh, you pass, you give the int decoder, decoder to unfoldable, then that what, what that's supposed to produce is uh, any unfoldable, doesn't matter, it'll take this array and turn it into whatever unfoldable you like. Uh, and so uh, the curious thing is that, like how do I remember the type of this, um, uh, this part, the, the decoder FA, because uh, so what I'm remember, I'm using the same strategy. So in order to uh, get the input, so I'm running, in order to get the array of forens, I'm, I'm using this. So this is a decoder. So this is essentially a decoder array foren or value. And then, 
And then I've got a way of decoding the stuff inside the array. So this is just, this tagger is actually just remembering this decoder. How do I decode what's on the inside? And then I capture the unfold R uh, instance. So uh, seeing as it's unfoldable, I've got this constraint, then uh, clearly we've, uh, uh, we've got a way to do un unfolding, a way to construct the container from, uh, and uh, so I just capture that and kind of remember it. And so here on the left, you can see uh, that I've, uh, I've got my, uh, uh, this, is, this is where I'm remembering th this stuff, the input. Oh yeah, so the array foreign tagger is a decoder of the inside. And then the unfolder says, you know, given, uh, uh, given some uh, stuff on the inside, uh, and uh, how, do we, uh, how do we start unrolling and producing the, uh, the container, whether it's a list or an array or a sequence or whatever kind of unfoldable it is. Um, so the curious thing is that, like, if you look at this fx, what, what I kind of want to say on uh, here, like if I was doing kind of an ordinary, uh, if I was doing the Koinea strategy or something, I could get rid of the x, uh, but I don't really want to get rid of the x. What I want to do is say that the, uh, that the a here is equivalent to fx. Um, and, and so uh, in order to do that, I, uh, I have to, instead of, of doing this sort of nice, see the thing about this uh, Koyaneda stuff is that I don't have to see the intermediate, like with a Koyaneda there was an i uh, type variable, and I don't have to see it here at all. But if I'm going to get this evidence, so here's my evidence that the A type is equivalent to the FX, but in order for that evidence to mean anything, I'm gonna to have to have the FX in here somewhere in order to tie it to the A up here. And uh, so what essentially this is doing is it's writing out uh, the Koyaneda right here in the, uh, uh, in the constructor. So, if you remember what the Koyaneda looked like, it was this sort of rank, uh, this rank two or even rank three function where um, you, uh, uh, you get supplied the, the things that you passed in and you can produce anything and then it'll, essentially this is your Koyaneda except written out in full here rather than uh, just reference the way I do it over here. So I can remember that a is equivalent to uh, uh, this uh, uh, fx, tying it to both of these types. And then when we use it, let's just find the run array case there. So when we use it, um, we, uh, we, can, we can get the array of foreigns, and then we can traverse that array with the, uh, the thing that decodes the insides. So we're using, um, so, we're, so we're first applying uh, the, to our input, the foreign value. We're first applying this decoder in order to get our array of foreigns. And then we're traversing that array and on everything inside the array, we're running our tagger, the thing that can decode the thing on the inside of the array. And then we're gonna run our unfolder uh, um, function that we've saved in order to actually construct the container that we want to construct. But the problem is, uh, let's say we took out this coercion. Let's say we didn't use our proof of what, of what A amounts to. Then, uh, then the compiler, the compiler knows that what this is all producing is this fx business, which over here uh, shows up as an f1x2, just because of the way the compiler is, is numbering these things as it infers the types. Uh, and so it knows it's getting an fx, but, it's, but 
it's supposed to be fully polymorphic. You know, we're supposed to be able to uh, uh, produce anything from anything. Uh, so it complains. I, I don't know how to unify uh, F1, X2 with A0. But the evidence we've saved here is precisely evidence that our A type is equivalent to Fx. And so if we put the, if we put the proof back in, then we can uh, uh, do a coercion. Oops. And it's perfectly happy uh, because uh, we've, we've proved that what this produces is the kind of thing that we've promised to produce. And this gets even a little bit crazier when we do the equal decoders uh, version of this. Uh, there's a couple of interesting twists here, actually. One is that, uh, for, for reasons I won't go into, sometimes when we're running, when we're checking the equality of decoders, sometimes we know that uh, the decoders are producing the same sort of thing. And for sort of complicated reasons, sometimes we don't know that. And even if we don't know what they're so supposed to produce, in some cases, we can still determine that they're equal. Uh, so I wanted to write some code that uh, if we knew they were the same type, we could do some additional things, but we could still do some things if we didn't know uh, that they were the same type. Now, Leibniz equality is mostly a, a compile time thing. It's not runtime type information. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's compile time information, but we can uh, put a, a wrap it in a maybe. And so I wrote a version of this function that might get evidence that A is, is the same type as B, but it might not. And then we can do slightly different things uh, in the one case or another. Uh, in some cases we can, uh, so we can, can, we might be able to can coerce an A to a B or an, and vice versa, or we might not. And uh, so I've kind of converted it into a bit of runtime evidence. Uh, and, and then in the run array, uh, when we're trying to check the equality of two runaway uh, constructors, we, so we've got this input, this tagger, and this unfolder, but the f and the x may or may not be the same in each case. So, uh, and, the, and the overall types may not be the same in each case. So we've got, uh, on the left, we know that uh, F1, X1 is equivalent to A. That's what our left proof tells us. And we know that our, uh, the, the right side of our comparison, we know that the B type is equivalent to F2, X2. And so I have to do a little bit of manipulation of the proof uh, in order to, uh, um, in order to uh, uh, get the kind of proof that I need, because what I really want to prove is that the uh, uh, the two inner decoders are the same. That's the uh, uh, that's the, the the payoff here that I need in order to go on and keep uh, comparing the, uh, uh, the the decoders in the way that I want to. So first of all, I have to map over the proof that I might have. So this proof is that that maybe. Uh, proof at the top. If I don't have that proof, then there's nothing more I can do. Uh, if I do have that proof, so I know that A is equivalent to B, then I can compose all the proofs. So my, my left proof uh, proves that A is equivalent to F1, X1. My right proof that B is equivalent to F2, X2. And if I have the middle proof that A is equivalent to B, then I just have to turn this one around and then compose them. And then what I've got is uh, proof that, um, that F1, X1 is equivalent to F2, X2. Uh, and then I can use this inner function in order to uh, prove that X1 is equivalent to X2, because really it has to be. Like if you, if you have uh, two types uh, like this that are uh, equivalent, 
then it, it's not possible for this, the inner type to be different from that inner type. Uh, the overall types couldn't possibly be the same unless the two inner types are also the same. Uh, and so you can do a little bit of manip manipulation of the proof. And then, um, and then down here, I can supply that as my proof for the next stage of the process. Uh, so it's just, a, I don't know, it's just a, a fascinating, I, I found it to be fascinating the way um, that you can end up uh, manipulating your evidence in order pr to produce uh, new evidence of, of just the kind uh, that you need in order to, uh, to carry on. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, basically what I wanted to uh, talk about. It, it was, what this is doing with this, this Leibniz proof is essentially simulating in uh, PureScript what in Haskell you would do with GADTs. In Haskell, there's a, a kind of a different way of writing a data declaration in which you would indicate um, uh, that uh, uh, particular constructors specialize the A in a particular way. And then, in, uh, ha and then if, you, if you construct your data constructors that way, in Haskell, uh, when you do a case statement like this, then Haskell automatically uh, specializes the A. Uh, it, it, in a sense, automatically does this um, uh, this business of coercing um, uh, that that you have to do manually here in PureScript. But the the interesting thing is that uh, you can actually do it. There there is a way of uh, uh, translating from what you would do in Haskell with GADTs to uh, um, PureScript. And there's a couple of really nice uh, blog posts uh, that, that outline this. But you know, I found when I read the blog posts, it, it was uh, uh, it's the kind of thing that, that it's difficult to wrap your head around, you know, until you really try it and see an ex or see an example of it that kind of works in your context. So it was it was very interesting trying to uh, you know to put this together and uh, see, see what I could do. Yeah, I'm going to have to come back and look through this in more detail later because <laughs> I'm also really interested in the uh, Coyonetta part of this and uh, the, the, like exactly how Leibniz is used in a real application. So, yeah, I'm really excited to see this. Yeah, so it's all, uh, it's all on GitHub. Uh, it's, it's in, uh, this is in the PureScript Elm-Elm-Compat uh, 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 library in my uh, GitHub uh, repo. Uh, so uh, you, can, you can take a, a look at it there. Yeah, thanks very much. So any, any other questions or comments? Uh, there were some comments in chat. Somebody was ah. re requesting somebody to implement gadgets in PureScript for us. <laughs> I, I, I think it'd be relatively easy to just add the syntax first. Just desugar it down to, you know, just, yeah, yeah. But. Yeah, I think Gadget gets kind of complicated for implementing. Yeah, I'm not really a compiler implementer, so I, I don't know how hard it is to uh, to do. But uh, but I sure needed them here. It it wouldn't have been uh, possible. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible to do what Elm does with these decoders uh, without the Leibniz equality and. Uh, it's uh, and it's it's kind of it's actually an example of of, of something in Elm that uh, 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 Elm often kind of descends to the JavaScript level in order to avoid uh, uh, kind of advanced type checking uh, 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 needing advanced type checking features and uh, it's it one of the things that I've enjoyed in uh, uh, doing a pure script version of the Elm framework is to try to figure out how to avoid that descent into JavaScript. Uh, 
try to figure out how to take some of the stuff that it's doing and, and actually make it well typed. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, you do have to jump through a fair number of hoops to, uh, to do that, but it's, uh, uh, it's worth it uh, in the end for a number of, for a number of reasons. And, uh, and in any event, it's fascinating. Yeah, the other interesting thing was, because one thing that Gadgets can do is they can bundle a, a type class instance with a specific constructor of a data type, right? So I thought that, oh, we can't do that at all in PureScript because like that's, like we, we can do like the, the Leibniz thing to simulate that part of Gadgets, but it looks like you figure out a way to, you know, join in, like you just put in an instance of a type class inside yeah, a specific that's right. so you data type constructor. The, uh, so that's, I think that's brilliant, man. Yeah, it, 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 uh, I was very impressed that it was possible to write a single function uh, to, to unwrap a decoder into any container you like, as long as it's got an unfoldable instance. I, uh, I thought that was uh, very cool. Uh, how, like one, thing, one other question I had was how your decoder, uh, in your mind, how do you think it compares to something like Argonaut? Um, I haven't looked very closely at Argonaut. I, I took a, a, a look at it. Uh, now, I'm not, I mean, one of the things that Argonaut and Foreign can do is have a, a kind of a class uh, uh, component uh, uh, so that you, you can, uh, like you can have the um, type classes that kind of automate some of this in a way. Uh, and I can't do that, or at least I can't totally rely on that in in porting in translating over the Elm framework because I don't want to. Uh, like I, I uh, like ideally, I ultimately want to be able to translate Elm code as mechanically as possible, and uh, and so I don't want to force people to add instances. So I've got to. Uh, uh, I can't rely on that stuff so much. Uh, and neither Argonaut or Foreign is, is interested in comparing decoders for equality. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a concern they have. And so they don't, have to, uh, uh, they don't have to be constructed in this sort of roundabout way. Uh, they don't have to have this split uh, between kind of remembering the inputs and then actually interpreting them. So. So th for that reason, this is much more complicated than, than their code. Yeah, I, I didn't even uh, know that Elm would need to diff a decoder function like this. That's really interesting. But uh, yeah, that's all the questions I've got. Um, I know in chat somebody uh, there's some discussion of uh, con extensions and such, but I'm not too familiar with that kind of stuff to discuss it. Yeah, some of the things um, that I'm doing, uh, it feels to me that some of the things I'm doing here probably have, how do I put it? Like they probably have names, if you know what I mean. Uh, well, I have to maybe. Go it, but uh, uh, some of the stuff, some of the other stuff probably has names too that uh, that I haven't figured out yet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if nobody else has questions, um, we're a little, a little bit over time here today. But so yeah, um, I suppose we could we could close out. Yeah, I mean, thank you for the presentation. That was really nice. Uh, I think maybe the array stuff could be encoded, like the recursivity of it could probably be encoded as a free monad maybe because you have the interpreter, you have almost everything that a free monad has. So it sounds, it looks at least, I'm not sure. And I'm, 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 I don't, didn't read enough of the code to, to be able to tell, but it looks like uh, something like that, of course. But other than that, it's it's really nice. And I think I've, I've heard a few conversations, or read rather, because it was on Slack between um, like guys like Liam and uh, Phil and uh, and so on. And I think they've discussed uh, uh, GADTs a few times. And I think the general consensus between them is we don't, like QScript doesn't need them because of Leibniz and because of all the other features. And because it feels like they're not I, I mean, they've been in Haskell for some time, but it still feels like they're, they're not really, the, the feature's not really settled yet, and there's a whole bunch of extensions that target them and so on. So I, I'm not sure we're going to get them very soon in PureScript. 
if at all. <laughs> yeah. We can make a fork of the picture compiler if somebody wants to <laughs> oh, play with it, I guess. I guess this is like a one good example away where we cannot do it with the, with the other like the existing features, right? And so far, I don't think anybody came up with a good example of, hey, we really need this because otherwise we cannot nicely implement X, right? So. Well, it'd be nice to even have the sugar, which we can write it like Gaddis, and then just have the sugar translated into using this Leibniz business. Sure, it's transferable. Like I think you need to write a bit more stuff, but you get more guarantees. But I, but I, I don't know enough about that to, to be sure. Yeah, I wonder if it could be done with a desugaring step. I might if I have a if I have a spare weekend sometime, I'll uh, I'll, I'll give that a try. I, I kind of I wonder myself whether that would work, but maybe maybe it would. The feel is that. GADTs provide less things, but are like less uh, laws, if you will, or free theorems, but you, you, they're easier to write, right? You, you need to write less code. And I'm not sure. That's my intuition, though. I, I, I've never looked into it. So if you ever look into that, please let us know, because I'm, I'm really curious whether it would be possible or not, at least on an example or something. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, well, I, I guess to close out then, um, there's, oh, there's PureScript Conf is coming up in a few weeks in Colorado. Um, so if anybody <laughs> later watches this and is interested in, is in the area and can speak at that, um, yeah, please think about organizing something. That's part of the Lambda Conf, is um, in Boulder? Yeah. yeah, it's the day after Lambda Cop is finished. Yeah, I was looking for details on Maybe the like website. June 7th or 8th, somewhere yeah, around there. I was looking for details on the website. I couldn't find anything about it. So, um, if any. Yeah, now there's some posts. I, I posted one in the discourse, and um, there is a link there to um, the. There's a GitHub, there's a wiki on the Lambda Conf GitHub. Um, repo and that wiki is going to be used to organize the speakers for PureScript Conf. So if I believe that if you're interested in speaking at PureScript Conf, you don't have to submit your thing to anybody and get permission. I think you just put your like the title of your talk down um, and like just the time that you want to give it there um, and any details. You just put it into the wiki. It's just editable, I, I Great. believe. Great. Looks like somebody's put up the links. Thank you. I'll, I'll take a look at that. I, yes, I was contemplating going to that conference, and and uh, I think the clincher will be if, if I can get to the peer script uh, portion as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it looks, it looks like the mini comps are going to be pretty open. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that that uh, wiki page said something about speakers, the Lambda Conf will give some support of some kind to speakers of peer script conf. Okay. So a little bit, a little bit of incentive for people to uh, try to put something together. Very quickly, mind you, that's only a couple of weeks away. <laughs> well, some people have uh, uh, been working on stuff for a long time, and that needs some extra motivation to just tie it up and finish it. Great. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. Otherwise, um, there's also um, oh, sorry, Zuri hat coming up next month, so. If anyone's around, then I'll be there, and just uh, probably I'll do some kind of mix of like pure uh, library stuff, and maybe like some looking at the compiler or PSC package. So yeah, if anyone is in Zurich Hack, then well, I'll be looking for whoever else is there. So I guess that that applies to like Europe, European people only. That's great. I guess it doesn't matter. Well, unless you're in Australia, I don't know of any in Australia. PureScript meetups in the last in the, in the next month, but yeah, everyone has is relatively close. I hope. Great. Thanks, everybody. This was really good. Now, Alex, you're going to. Um, uh, this will be up on YouTube shortly. I hope. 
because I missed the first part. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll, right. I'll put it up on YouTube. It takes a while to upload, but it'll, take a, it'll be a few hours. Good. Yep. So yeah, good seeing you all. We'll hope to, hope to see you next month. Um, yeah, see you around. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. I'll hop off now. Bye-bye.